Hello everybody, good evening and welcome. I'm Emma Griffin, I'm the President of the Royal Historical Society and this is the first in the Society's annual lecture series for 2022. Well, as many of you will know, the Society, alongside a very wide range of activities that we do to support the discipline of history, sponsors six lectures a year that seek to showcase some of the very best history being undertaken in the UK today. And I've got absolutely no doubt that Andrew's lecture tonight on monks in the age of the Crusades will be a wonderful exemplar for us. OK, moving on then, tonight's speaker is Professor Andrew Jatiski, Professor of Medieval History at Royal Holloway, University of London. Andrew is a specialist in the religious cultures and institutions of the medieval Mediterranean, with a particular interest in the areas where Latin and Greek lives and practices intersect. It's this focus on intersections between Greek and Western European cultures that's shaped Andrew's uh, research over a number of years in fields such as crusading, hermits and monks, fasting and asceticism and pilgrimage. Andrew's principal publications include his recent Latin and Greek monasticism in the Crusader States, co-authored with the late Bernard Hamilton, as well as seven, yes, you heard that correctly, seven earlier books and edited collections, which include The Perfection of Solitude, Hermits and Monks in the Crusader States, The Penguin Historical Atlas of the Medieval World, and the intriguingly titled The Hermit's Cookbook, Food, uh, sorry, Monks, Food and Fasting in the Middle Ages. Well, this evening, Andrew will engage with cultural intersections in a lecture entitled Monks and the Muslim Enemy, Conversion, Polemic and Resistance in Monastic Hagiography in the Age of the Crusades, circa 1000 to 1250. Andrew will consider the medieval use of monastic hagiography as a means of articulating resistance to Islam based on conversion and polemic rather than violence. So I invite you to sit back and listen to Andrew speak on his lecture tonight. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, Emma. And I want to start by thanking the committee, uh, Emma obviously as president and also the past president of the RHS, Margot Finn, for inviting me to give this talk this evening. Uh, naturally, I wish that it could have been in more agreeable circumstances in which I could have spoken directly to an audience. Um, but um, I'm, of course, delighted to be able to uh, share my thoughts with many more of you. Uh, than might have been the case if we'd been meeting in person. Conventionally, historians writing about the relations between Christians and the Islamic world in the 11th to 13th centuries have thought rather more about war, and particularly holy war, than they have about dialogue and conversion. We tend to think of the Christian world, at least outside the Iberian Peninsula, as having little knowledge or understanding of and little interest in the Islamic world before the First Crusade and the settlement of Western Europeans in the Eastern Mediterranean. This lack of knowledge has often been seen by historians as a characteristic feature of the Western approach to the Islamic world. And as has often been said, most crusading narratives referred to the Crusaders adversaries either as Turks or by deploying labels drawn from the Old Testament, focusing on their ethnic or supposed ethnic rather than religious identity. Where religious identity is invoked, crusade narratives are just as likely to draw attention to the Turks as pagans, barbarians, or indeed as heretics. This apparent lack of interest can sometimes seem odd on the part of participants in what's usually characterized in current historiography at least, as a religious war fought for spiritual reasons. The spirituality of contemporary narratives of crusading appears to, to be invested less in a clash between different religious systems and still less a clash of civilizations than in the holiness of the sites to be reconquered from an enemy in possession and the purity of intent on the part of those dedicated to their recovery. This consideration has made the question of dialogic exchange, polemic and conversion bulk rather less large than we might expect in a holy war, especially given that so many of the contemporary narratives originated in monasteries. Until the middle of the 13th century, remarkably little attention was paid to the potential of crusading for the conversion of Muslims, nor indeed to the prospect of using the conquest of territory as a means of enforcing conversion. Indeed, in the mid 13th century, 
papal legate to the East complained that Frankish landowners in the Kingdom of Jerusalem were passing up opportunities to bring Muslim peasants on their estates to Christianity. The reason for this lack of interest in conversion, paralleled in other regions, notably Sicily, has been well explained by historians in terms of economic advantage in light of canon law rulings against the enslavement of Christians by Christians. But acceptance of this reason has perhaps made us reluctant to consider more fully the question of polemic and conversion in encounters between Christians and Muslims. There are, of course, exceptions. William Chester Jordan has shown in his recent book, The Apple of His Eye, that Louis IX, shown here on his way to crusade, not only took conversion of Muslims seriously as a potential outcome of his crusade, but brought Muslim converts, in some cases whole families, back to France with him in 1254. But Louis, after all, was a saint, and perhaps his saintliness consisted partly in his understanding of holy war, precisely as an opportunity for evangelism. I invoke Louis's sanctity here with only a tinge of irony, because in this paper I want to explore some earlier instances of polemic and conversion in encounters with Muslims in hagiographical texts emanating from monasteries, and to suggest that confrontation with Muslims had been an important feature of the construction of Christian sanctity for a long time before the Crusades. The heart of my discussion will focus on examples from three early medieval Italo-Greek hagiographies. In other words, saints' lives in Greek and about Greek-speaking monks, but whose careers played out in southern Italy in the 9th and 10th centuries. As I'll argue, the significance of these texts for my theme today lies not only in the encounters with Muslims narrated in the texts, but also in the rediscovery and reuse of the texts in the period of the Crusades from the late 11th century onward. These episodes of Italo-Greek monastic encounters with Muslims are not unusual in Greek hagiographical texts from the 9th to the 11th centuries, but they haven't been absorbed into the landscape of Christian Islamic interactions before the First Crusade. Inevitably much, though not all of that landscape, has been sketched by historians of the Crusades. And perhaps for that reason, much of it has a rather deterministic character, a search for the roots of a phenomenon that came to characterize Western views of the Islamic world in the 12th and 13th centuries. In recent years, for example, we've seen renewed appeals to see the Norman conquest of Sicily in the late 11th century as, quote, a crusade before the fact, as though the conflicts in the Eastern Mediterranean initiated by the papacy in 1095, the first crusade, formed a normative framework within which a global set of relationships was formulated and can be tested. In one sense, such a take on Christian views of Muslims is not surprising. Reading the words of Thomas Madden, I quote, the Crusades were in every way a defensive war. They were the West's belated response to the Muslim conquest of fully two thirds of the Christian world. We might be reminded of the opening chapter of the deeds of God through the Franks by the, the chronicler Guibert of Nogent. In his theologized retelling of the First Crusade, written in about 1108 or 9, so 10 years after the end of the First Crusade, Guibert talks about Europe as an isolated corner of Christian civilization assailed on three sides by enemies. This view from a northern French monastery places the defense of civilization as a feature of the cultural habitus of reform monasticism. Historians of monasticism have also picked up on this theme, and there's been considerable interest lately in exploring the role of the monastery of Cluny in the construction of a matrix of, quote, Christendom on the defensive. The classic exposition of this theme is Dominic Ionia Pratt's influential book, Ordonné et Exclure, Cluny et la Société Chrétienne face à l'hérésie au Judaïsme et l'Islam. Ionia Pratt saw the 12th century abbot Peter the Venerable, commissioner of the first Latin translation of the Quran and compiler of a dossier of anti-Islamic polemic, 
as the guiding figure behind the construction of a Cluniac identity in which the monastery formed the intellectual and spiritual engine room of the defense of Christendom against the challenges posed by heresy and unbelief. Peter invokes the same siege mentality as Guibert in a letter to Peter of Poitiers, for example, claiming that, quote, Satan has occupied half the earth with his Saracens. A recent book by Scott Bruce, Cluny and the Muslims of La Garde Crassinée, can be read almost as a prequel to Yonya Prat. Starting with the notable episode of the capture of Abbot Maolus of Cluny in 972 by Muslim raiders based in Fraxinatum in southern France, Bruce traces the retelling of this story by subsequent Cluniac writers from the late 10th to the 12th centuries. Scott Bruce's model sees Peter the Venerable as the culminating point of a project that had begun in the 990s, with a series of hagiographical studies of Abbot Maolus that explored the significance of his kidnapping, his confrontation with the Muslim raiders, and his eventual release on payment of a ransom, and then the final outcome, the destruction of the raiders' base of Fraxinatum. Cluniacs were not alone in reflecting these interests. Other hagiographical texts from the 11th century appear to corroborate a growing concern with the need for defense against Muslims. The Provençal knight Bobo devoted much of his life to fighting the Muslims of Fraxinatum and was venerated as a saint at Vogera in the Po Valley. A life of Bobo from the early 11th century makes clear that his sanctity lay in the use to which he put his arms in defending Christendom. Scott Bruce's study challenges accepted previous uh, notions. Excuse me, sorry, Let's find my place. Scott Bruce's study challenges accepted models of Western Europe, largely ignorant of and oblivious to the Muslim world and Islamic beliefs in the period before the Crusades. He finds the second life of Abbot Maolus, written before 1010 by the Cluniac monk Cyrus, particularly significant in this respect. In this version of the story, the captive Maolus is subjected to attacks by his kidnappers, not only on his person, but on Christian doctrines. He defends himself by seizing the initiative and preaching to them. I quote, he seized the shield of faith and making the case for the Christian religion pierced the enemies of Christ with the blade of God's word. More specifically, Maolus argued that his captor's conception of God was false, that they were worshipping a human construct, and that their God did not have the power to free himself from punishment, let alone help his worshippers. By the time the story was retold by the Cluniac monk Ralph Glaber in about 1040, further details have been added. In this version, there's an exchange among the raiders over how to treat Myolus. Was he a genuine man of God? and should he be shown reverence as such. In Glaber's version, some of the Muslims examine the Bible that Maolus had with him and recognize the prophets of the Old Testament as the same venerated by them. The interchange then becomes charged with a sharper glimmer of mutual recognition between Muslim and Christian. It has been suggested, first to my knowledge, in fact, by a past president of this society, Sir Richard Southern, that this exchange contains the first mention of the prophet Muhammad by name by any writer north of the Alps. And according to Scott Bruce, I quote, the debate between the abbot of Cluny and his Muslim captors about the principles of the Christian faith in Cyrus's life was unprecedented in Latin literature composed north of the Pyrenees in the early Middle Ages. Southern and Bruce were both conscious of a necessary exemption from their claims for texts produced in regions where Christians were more likely to come into actual contact with Muslims, notably the Iberian Peninsula after the Arab conquest and settlement of the 8th century, and southern Italy after the Arab conquest of Sicily in the 9th century. I don't propose to address any Iberian sources directly in this paper, but I'd like to offer by way of further contribution to the studies of Yonia Pra and Bruce, the Italo-Greek hagiographical tradition, which has not really been deployed thus far by historians examining, examining this kind of interchange in the West. 
Although the primary purpose of the Italo-Greek hagiographical texts I'm going to talk about was to establish the sanctity of the protagonists of the lives within the set parameters of the genre, and thereby to provide liturgical material for the celebration of the saints' feast days and exemplary material for monastic reading. The human landscape in which that sanctity was earned was one in which the saints had to show their mettle in different ways in dealing with challenges from Muslims. The saints' lives I want to discuss therefore feature set piece encounters between Muslims and Christians in which polemical dialogue and in one case conversion play important roles. Such encounters can be understood as a feature of the construction of sanctity in this tradition. The three Italo-Greek vitae I have in mind come from the 10th and 11th centuries, and they are the life of Elias the Younger, or as I'll refer to him, Elias of Enna, the life of Elias Speliotta, or Elias the Troglodyte, and the life of Vitalis of Castronuovo. All three derive from the orbit of Calabrian monasticism and reflect a period of disruption and political turmoil during the aftermath of the conquest of Sicily in the ninth century. All three are set within a context of crusade, uh, sorry, of, of conquest, raid, and continual insecurity in Sicilia, in Sicily and Calabria. The ever-present threat of raids and violence against Christian communities is a theme, indeed, in some ways, the narrative backcloth in all three of the lives. Italo-Greek hagiographical traditions were strongly coloured by the 9th century Aglabid conquest of Sicily and subsequent Byzantine attempts at reconquest, which caused the widespread migration of Greek-speaking Christians from urban centres in Sicily to rural Calabria and Apulia. This is a feature of other Italo-Greek hagiographies, for example, the life of St. John Theristes or of St. Saba the Younger. More broadly, Byzantine hagiography of the period often deploys suffering at the hands of Arab raiders as a stage in the journey to sanctity. Three ninth century female saints, Theodora of Thessaloniki, Athanasia of Aegina, and Theoctisti of Lesbos, all suffered at the hands of Arab raiders. Theodora and Athanasia were forced to flee their island of Aegina as a consequence of the Arab conquest of the 820s, and both subsequently became nuns. Theoctisti was captured by Arab pirates and escaped to lead a life of solitary asceticism. And St. Euthemius the Younger, a ninth century monk of Mount Athos, was captured by Arab raiders, but returned to his hermitage unharmed when the kidnappers realized his holiness. The Italo-Greek vitae are linked in other ways that indicate shared traditions and probably shared textual knowledge. For example, the life of Elias the Troglodyte contains an account of the death of Elias of Enna, and Elias the Troglodyte is directed in the Eremitic life by Daniel, a monastic disciple of Elias of Enna. Vitalis of Castronuovo is said to have been related to Elias of Enna. Spiritual kinship is a characteristic feature of Greek Orthodox monasticism, and the network drawn by the Vitae encompasses many of the notable Italo-Greek monastic figures of the period, Luke of Armentum, Fantino the Younger, Nihilus of Rossano, and the wonderfully named Nicephorus the Nude. But there are also links to the major monastic figures and trends in the orbit of Constantinople. Thus, Nicephorus the Nude, who through discipleship from Fantino is linked to Elias the Troglodyte, was also the disciple of Athanasius the Athenite, the founder of Cenobitic monasticism on Mount Athos. So there's a distinctive networking character in this genre of hagiography. And it's a networking that reminds us of the gravitational pull of Constantinople. Anik Peters Christo has argued that the ideals of eremitism and personal austerity that are so characteristic of Italo-Greek hagiography should be seen not only as a response to remote rural settlement in the mainland, but also as a sign of connections with contemporary monastic reform in Constantinople. And as Agostino Pertuzzi observed, in Apulia in particular, 
the influence of the Studite reform of the ninth century in Constantinople can be seen in manuscripts of Studite ascetic texts copied in Greek monasteries in the region. In this light, it's striking to note textual influences on the life of Elias of Enna, not only from what we might call universal early texts known widely across the monastic world, such as Athanasius's fourth century life of Antony, but also from texts that are specific to Syria and the Holy Land. And I'm thinking here of the fifth century accounts of Syrian monks in Theodoret of Cyrus's uh, religious history and Cyril of Scythopolis's sixth century lives of Euthemius and Saba. Cyril in particular provided models for the kinds of fluidity between settled and wandering monasticism that is so typical of Italo-Greek hagiography. And of course, so inimical to Benedictine monasticism of the West. Typical spiritual traits in Italo-Greek hagiography are a master disciple relationship, fasting, the gift of tears, nudity or the wearing of sparse clothing, and the practice of grazing, uh, living off vegetation that grew in the wild. In the lives of these three saints, we also find a streak of prophecy, particularly in the relation to the threat of Arab raids, sometimes tinged with eschatological concerns. Pertuzzi has characterized Italo-Greek monasticism of the period before the 11th century as quote, a perpetual oscillation between a type of anchoritism or hesychastic eremitism and a lavra or cenobitic community. In all three of these lives, the kinds of encounters with Muslims that, that I'm interested in here, in other words, exchanges of views about their faith, are fairly fleeting and brief, but nonetheless, they are significant points within the narratives. So I'm going to summarize them in chronological order starting with the life of Elias of Enna. The whole course of Elias of Enna's life was shaped by the experience of the Aglabid conquest of his homeland, Sicily. Captured as a boy of 12 during the conquest, he's enslaved but sold to a Christian family in North Africa. He's eventually able to buy his freedom and sets out on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, where he adopts the habit of a monk at the Holy Sepulchre, before continuing his pilgrimage to the Jordan, Galilee, and Mount Sinai. He subsequently returns to Sicily, but his career is characterized by mobility. From Palermo to Taormina, then to Greece, then a pilgrimage to Rome in the 880s, then back to Calabria, where he founds a monastery at Reggio, and finally, he dies at Thessaloniki in northern Greece uh, on his way to a meeting with the emperor. The encounter with Muslims occurs during his pilgrimage in the Holy Land. He comes across, across 12 Muslims uh, called Agarines uh, in the text, who in a threatening manner ask him to explain the principles of the Christian religion and especially of the Trinity. Elias delivers a lengthy sermon that includes a statement of faith drawn from the Nicene Creed. And I won't read it, it's um, the, the, the paragraph on the slide. He then goes on to explain that the false belief of the Ishmaelites or Muslims has no coherence, drawn as it is from different sects. Their view of Christ as only human and not God makes them, he claims, Arians, referring to the early Christian heresy. Their practices, uh, such as circumcision, makes them followers of the Jewish law. There follows an attack on the prophet who Elias says has simply cobbled together the worst of different sects and for whose revelation there is no verifiable authority. The outcome of this encounter is, as we might predict, the conversion and baptism of the 12 Muslims before Elias completes his pilgrimage and returns to Sicily. The encounters with Muslims in the other two texts are briefer, more ephemeral perhaps, but nonetheless significant in the context of polemical exchange. Oh, sorry, I've gone too far. That's what I want. Elias the Troglodyte, Elias Speliotta, was a Calabrian by birth who lived as a hermit after the woman his parents had tried to make him marry was killed in a raid. He then took the habit of a monk under the senior monk Arsenius at Reggio. 
Both Elias and Arsenius fled to Greece to, ex to escape raiding and lived for eight years in an abandoned tower at Patras, where they disposed of a demon who had been tormenting the populace. They had to return to Calabria after attracting rather too much of the attention of the powerful. At first, there was an attempt to seduce Elias by the wife of a powerful notable. Uh, then a bishop made advances towards Arsenius. When they tried to leave Patras, uh, the bishop tried to detain them with a false accusation of the theft of liturgical books. Eventually, they were able to return to Calabria, but Arsenius soon died, and Elias re-entered the monastery of St. Eustratius, uh, having buried uh, Arsenius there. On a further raid by Muslims from Sicily, Arsenius's tomb at St. Eustratius was attacked. The raiders broke it open, thinking they might find lucrative precious metals inside. But what they find instead is the incorrupt body of the monk, uh, both body and his clothing, in exactly the state in which they'd been when he was buried. The point of interest for us comes in the words put in the mouths of the Muslims when they come across, across the body of Arsenius. Uh, look, here is one of those whom stupid Christians say will, at the day of judgment, judge the living and the dead. The earliest manuscript of the text compresses this episode into a concise couple of sentences. Nevertheless, there's enough here to hear mockery on the part of the Muslims, both of Christian ideas of sanctity and of the doctrine of the resurrection of the body. Having initially opened the tomb to rob it of any treasure, they decide to burn the body because Christians believe in the resurrection of the body and if it is burned, it will presumably not be raised from the dead. For them, the body of the dead monk represents the body of Christ, and the attempt to destroy it by fire is a deliberate act of repudiation of Christian beliefs. The attempt at burning the body of Arsenius is a trope of early Christian monastic martyrology. We can find a parallel, although without, in this case, the mockery of the resurrection of the body, in the 6th century life of Caraton, a Palestinian saint, where Arab raiders attempt to burn the bodies of Caraton and his monastic followers. In a later 14th century version of the life of Elias the Troglodyte, um, the mockery of the Muslim centers instead on Christian belief in Christ's divinity. In the text, Elias goes on to have further adventures, including one with a levitating Ethiopian demoniac, which I'm sorry that I don't have time to go into more now, uh, but that's the extent of the involvement with Muslims. He eventually founds uh, the cave monastery from which he took his name and uh, which you can see at the site of which you can see on the slide here. The third uh, life, that of Vitalis of Castronuovo, uh, follows a broadly similar pattern. Vitalis, like Elias of Enna, a Sicilian, becomes a monk in youth, goes on pilgrimage to Rome, then becomes an eremitical monk in Calabria before settling in Apulia. He builds a monastery but withdraws into the wilderness again. He tames wild animals, mortifies his flesh, and diverts a flood that, that threatens to destroy crops. He's visited by the great abbot Luke of Armentum, whom he cures of stomach complaints after he'd first uh, fed him wild mushrooms that disagreed with him. He attracts eremitical followers, restores a ruined church, which he refounds as a monastery, performs miracles and heals, and then spares the town of Bari from a violent storm. Back in Calabria, he is captured in a raid from Sicily. The Muslim raiders are at first interested in the material wealth of the monastery before realizing that Vitalis doesn't have any livestock, barn full of crops, vineyards, or indeed movable treasures. They try instead to kill Vitalis, but the barbarian, um, quoted from the text, who has laid hands on him, is struck by a lightning bolt and falls on his face. Other raiders see a column of fire in front of Vitalis stretching into the heavens, and while they're in this terrified state, Vitalis takes the opportunity to deliver the short homily or instruction uh, that you can see on the slide. Cease from shedding the blood of Christians, stop wanting to capture their homes. Almighty God will not permit you to do this. He wants you, like wise and well-taught men, to leave behind these bad ways, to convert 
and live according to his holy precepts. He does not will the death of the sinner, but that he should convert and live in knowledge of him and in penance. For it was for this that the Son of God came down from heaven to earth. And although he was truly God, through his immense goodness, he became truly man. You, however, are ignorant of all contrition, and you do not want to know that life, that holy and life-giving destiny. For he will come again from heaven to where he ascended and destroy all pride and all those who blaspheme his name. Vitalis continues by drawing parallels between the Saracens and the Egyptians of the Old Testament who were drowned in the Red Sea, warning that they will similarly suffer the anger of God unless they desist from persecuting Christian people. So in all three of these texts, there's an encounter with Muslims that features some explanation of or reference to the central tenets of Christian teaching. In all three, Muslims are a people associated with violence, robbery, and murder of Christians. Although in the life of Elias of Enna, the encounter in which Christianity is explained turns out, despite Elias's foreboding, to be entirely peaceful. Indeed, the exchange with them is initially at the invitation of the Muslims. In two of the texts, a violent attempt is made by the Muslims against a saint, in one case living in another dead. In both, that violence is overcome by miraculous power. In two of the texts, the encounter becomes an occasion of conversion or attempted conversion. In all three, the encounter is a constituent element, even if a relatively minor one, in the construction of sanctity. I've already drawn attention to some elements in the lives that indicate um, broadly the influence of Palestinian and to some extent Syrian monastic traditions. The polemical nature of the encounters with Muslims also suggests such a milieu. It may be significant, for example, that Elias of Enna's conversion of Muslims occurs not in his homeland, but in the Holy Land, a location that may consciously recall the corpus of about 60 Christian Arabic hagiographic and polemical texts from the mid 9th to the 10th centuries that have been studied by Sidney Griffith. The exchange between Elias of Enna and Muslims has something in common with the life of Theodore of Edessa, which features a set piece debate about the merits of Christianity and Islam, which survives in both a Greek and Arabic version, probably dating from the early 10th century. We might also be reminded of the 9th century Passio of the monks of Sabbat, George, and the martyrs of Cordoba, in which George tells the Cardi before whom he's arraigned, quote, do you think I could believe anything good of your master, the disciple of Satan? I believe that he who had appeared to him in the guise of an angel had in reality been a demon. He is in fact a perfidious and worthless believer in the devil, a minister of Antichrist and a labyrinth of all the vices. The difference, strikingly, is the Irenic quality of the Italo-Greek life in contrast with the life of Theodore in which the saint is martyred when he seems to be prevailing in debate against his Muslim captors. And indeed, one might say the same uh, of the Passio of George and the martyrs of Cordoba. The argument deployed by Elias, particularly the accusation that Islamic teaching is basically Arianism and that its practices are Judaizing, seem to be taken by the author of the life from the eighth century author John of Damascus. Again, an indication of an intellectual and textual milieu with connections to Constantinople and the Holy Land, since John of Damascus had been a monk at the desert, at the uh, Judean desert monastery of St. Saba. The harmonious exchange in the encounter with Muslims in the life of Elias of Enna should not mislead us, however. In two of the three Italo Greek hagiographies, uh, the life of Elias of Enna and the life of Vitalis, the terms used to describe uh, the Muslims are barbarians, Hagarines, Ishmaelites, or Saracens. This is fairly standard terminology shared by Greek monastic texts from the Eastern Mediterranean and Constantinople dealing with Arab incursions that seek to draw attention to violence and conquest. So we can find similar language in uh, texts such as the Passion of the Twenty Martyrs of St. Saba, Chronographia of Theophanes, 
and the lives of the uh, of two of, of Theodore of Thessaloniki, Athanasia of Aegina and Theoctistia of Lesbos, which I mentioned earlier. Just to pick two further 11th century Greek monastic texts, the life of Lazarus of Mount Gelesion and the testament of the monastic founder Christodoulos. Again, we find Muslim conquerors described in the same terms, even though the contexts are quite different. The passage in the life of Lazarus is set in the first decade of the 11th century, and Lazarus is fleeing the Holy Land from the Fatimid Caliph al-Hakim's persecution of Christians, whereas Christodoulos was recounting his flight from the Holy Land in the face of Seljuk invasion. But just as two of the Italo-Greek hagiographies, the life of Elias the Troglodyte and the life of Vitalis, emphasize sacrilegious robbery on the part of the Arab raiders, so the life of Lazarus characterizes the Fatimids carrying out the destruction of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem in 1009 as, quote, sacrilegious and thieving. The Testament of Christodoulos, an account of how the founder came to establish his monastery on the island of Patmos, tells briefly but in vivid tones of his flight from Jerusalem. For him, the Seljuks were, quote, the Saracen swarm, a barbarian phalanx, spreading like a monstrous hailstorm with a baneful rattling and gibbering, destroying and annihilating the whole of Christian society. Recently, Alexander Bayhammer has examined changing Byzantine attitudes towards the Seljuks from the 11th to 12th centuries. He finds that while during the 12th century, expressions of anger and fear are expressed in terms of religious antagonism, earlier Byzantine discourse focuses rather on, on Muslims as barbarians who are morally inferior. And traces of this pervade even 12th century rhetoric. So Bayhammer has drawn attention to the orations of Theodore Prodromos to John the Second, the Emperor John the Second, Komnenos, where we find verbal construction such as, quote, that muddled mob originating from Hagar, and those of Eustathius of Thessaloniki to Emperor Manuel, which have strong overtones of a dialogue between Hellenism and barbarism. The prevalent note in all of these texts is one that dehumanizes the Muslim enemy. And to some extent, that fits with the general tone of the Italo-Greek texts I've been discussing. These Italo-Greek texts, I think, all merit a more systematic comparison of their polemical content with earlier or contemporary Byzantine polemics against Islam. But the passage in which Vitalis compares the Muslims with the Egyptians of the Old Testament is particularly striking. As Catherine Allen Smith has recently shown, Latin crusade narratives and papal letters from the 12th and 13th centuries exploit similar parallels. And in Latin monastic discourse more generally, Egypt is found as a term of opprobrium for sinfulness. But the sentiment expressed in the life of Vitalis that God will not allow the Muslim raiders to prevail against Christians is also found in a similar context in an 11th century Latin text from Italy. In the dialogues of Desiderius of Monte Cassino, a Muslim raiding fleet that had burned Monte Cassino in 846 was destroyed by the miraculous appearance of Saints Benedict and Peter, with an accompanying speech by St. Peter to the effect that the Hagarenes, who are described in the text as heretics and Jews, are God's instrument to inflict punishment on Christians, but not to defeat them utterly. The labelling of the Muslim raiders as heretics and Jews is, I think, particularly striking, since it echoes that identification of Muslims with Jews made by Elias of Enna. Now, I'm sure it won't have escaped your attention that my citations from the, Lys, the life of Elias the Troglodyte and the life of Vitalis were in Latin, not Greek. And I want now to turn to the question of the reception and readership of these Italo-Greek hagiographies, and in doing so, bring my discussion back to wider questions about Western monastic attitudes to Islam. Both the life of Elias the Troglodyte and the life of Vitalis of Castronuovo were translated into Latin. The life of Elias in about 1080, and the life of Vitalis in 1194. Indeed, the Greek original of the life of Elias, Elias the Troglodyte no longer survives. 
So the Latin translation is the earliest text we have, although a subsequent Greek version was made uh, from a retranslation of the Latin in the early 14th century. So what were the circumstances of these translations into Latin? The Latin version of the life of Elias the Troglodyte was made at the monastery of Santa Euphemia in Calabria. And I've indicated that on the um, Google Maps um, map on the right of the slide. The manuscript containing the life dates from the 12th century and contains hagiographical lives according to the calendar from mid-April to mid-September. The presence of saints such as Arduenus, of the 7th century Archbishop of Rouen indicates a Norman influence on the calendar. But other lives in the manuscript, including, of course, the life of Elias of Enna, show a southern Italian influence. The monastery of Santa Euphemia was founded in 1062 with an endowment from Robert Giscard, the Norman ruler of the region, on the site of the cave monastery founded by Elias the Troglodyte, and its first abbot was Robert of Grandmenil, formerly abbot of Santa Vrul uh, in Normandy. Uh, Robert of Grandmenil had been exiled from Normandy after incurring the, incurring the suspicion of William the Conqueror and had uh, gone to, um, to southern Italy with a, a group of monks from Normandy. The endowment for the monastery seems to have been considerable. Like other Oatville family foundations, it was directly subject to the papacy. And it was probably during Robert of Gromaniel's abbacy that the translation of the life of Elias was undertaken. Why, we may wonder, was he interested in undertaking or having such a translation made? Well, not only was Santa Euphemia founded on the site of an older Greek monastery, but among its endowments was the still functioning cave monastery of Elias the Troglodyte itself. Graham Loud has suggested that the translation was part of an attempt to appropriate the cult of Elias, perhaps to ensure the transfer of its property. And this indeed sounds perfectly plausible as a reason. The appropriation of the cave monastery was once seen as a sign of the enforced Latinization of the indigenous monastic landscape. This isn't really a sustainable inference, given that what we seem to be witnessing is in fact the transfer of a functioning Greek community to Latin possession. Moreover, Norman interest in the veneration of local saints was already well established by the 1080s. Stephen, the Norman Bishop of Troia between 1059 and 80, had in about 1067 commissioned a new Latin work on the discovery of the body of Secondinus, uh, an early, probably semi-legendary bishop of the town on whose site Troia was later built. As Paul Oldfield has argued, promoting a local cult helped to reconcile the largely Greek urban community with the new Norman. The life of Vitalis of Castronuovo was translated at the request of Robert, Bishop of Tricarico between 1187 and 94, and the translation is addressed to him. Tricarico in the Basilicata region of southern Italy was a diocese with a strongly Greek cultural orbit. And again, the pin on the Google map uh, shows you where it is. The cathedral chapter of Tricarico included Greek as well as Latin speakers. In fact, um, the epistle and gospel was chanted uh, in the mass, was chanted in Greek by some canons as late as the 18th century. Liturgical rites were sometimes celebrated in Greek instead of Latin. And as also happened in the Crusader states, auxiliary Greek rite bishops were appointed to administer sacraments uh, to Greek speakers in the diocese. In 1203, just a few years after the life of Vitalis was translated, the cathedral cantor of Tricarico, the son of a Greek priest and someone who'd received minor orders according to the Greek rite, was elected Bishop of Anglona. The Archbishop of the province, wrote to Pope Innocent III to ask if this was acceptable, and the Pope ruled that it was, as long as it did not cause outrage to the chapter. These translations of Greek texts in the Norman period obviously raise wider questions about the religious politics of the Norman settlement in the Mezzogiorno, questions over which there has, of course, been very considerable scholarly debate and disagreement. 
To summarize the historiography very crudely, the traditional view as espoused, for example, by Louis Robert Ménager was that the Normans effectively liquidated Greek monasteries or at least denuded them of property, which they then gave to their own Latin foundations and put an end to Greeks holding Episcopal office. With regard to bishops and Episcopal office, this view has been rejected, particularly by Graham Loud and Vera von Falkenhausen, and more recently by Annick Peters Custo. It's now accepted that there were in fact remarkably few forced Latinizations of bishoprics, and that in most cases Latins were appointed only after a see had become vacant. It was only when a Greek bishop refused to accept Roman authority, as for example was the case with Basil, the Metropolitan of Reggio, that he was deprived. Vera von Falkenhausen has pointed to examples of pragmatism in appointments. Uh, for example, John, Den John of Nicaforo, the first Latin Bishop of Squillace in 1096, was of mixed Greek and Latin origins, perhaps bilingual. The Cathedral of Anglona, whose chapter elected the Greek cantor, was enlarged at the end of the 12th century, perhaps because of the addition of a Greek chapter from nearby Tursi. The sees of Crotone and Santa Severina had a Greek bishop until the end of the 13th century, Opido, Opido Mamatina as late as 1400, and Gallipoli and Bova into the 16th century. So there's ample reason to understand the translations of Italo-Greek hagiographies within a hybridizing culture. In emphasizing the Norman pragmatic modus vivendi as the context of these acts of translation, we must, however, be careful not to miss the significance of the context in which I frame this, this discussion, the landscape of Muslim Christian encounters. It seems to me that we have to think not just about the fact that Greek texts are being translated into Latin, but about the content of those texts, which we have to assume were read and used by their Latin communities in similar ways to Latin hagiographical texts. In other words, liturgically and for didactic and instructive purposes. No Latin audience could miss the fact that part of the construction of sanctity in such texts is a polemical confrontation with Muslims in which the tenets of the faith are presented or demonstrated miraculously. So what might the instances of Christian Muslim interaction in these texts have told Latin audiences? Well, as I've indicated, the underlying message in respect of Christian Muslim dynamics in the hagiographies is concerned with expounding the principles of Christian doctrine, particularly on the Trinity and the resurrection. So one might say the message of those episodes, at least, is concerned with uh, conversion. What it's not concerned with, it seems to me, is holy war. In the 1080s, when the life of Elias the Troglodyte was translated, a preoccupation with the tenets of the faith, even with conversion, does not seem out of line with concerns in other Norman sources. Let me take just two examples from roughly the same period. There's a well-known passage in Edmer's Life of Anselm, when Anselm, the Archbishop of Canterbury in exile from England, is present at the Siege of Capua in 1098. Here he encounters the Sicilian Muslims fighting in the service of Count Roger. And he's so impresses by his conducts and his words, uh, the Muslims, that according to Edma, his hagiographer, they would have converted to Christianity if Roger himself had not forbidden this. Now, whether we believe that they would or wouldn't is unimportant. The point is that here is a more or less contemporary hagiography written in a Norman orbit in which Muslims are encountered as non-Christians ripe for conversion rather than as a legitimate enemy. Another example, also from the 1090s, occurs in the Chronicle of Geoffrey Malaterra. Here, during Geoffrey's account of the Norman conquest of Sicily, we encounter a Muslim convert to Christianity named Elias Cartomensis, who's executed when he's recaptured by Sicilian Muslims and refuses to renounce his Christianity. It's a martyrdom story, obviously, owing much to early Christian martyrologies, and the point is to demonstrate the steadfastness in faith that's part of a Christian witness. The 12th century Historia Secular, which is largely but not entirely a retelling of Malaterra's chronicle, 
gives extra nuance to the story of Elias by describing him not only as a Christian, but as some, someone who become not only Christian, but through his zealous defense of the faith, effectively a Norman. And here it's perhaps worth recalling Alex Metcalfe's characterization of pre-Norman Sicily as, quote, a frontier colony with a fractious, diverse and changing population, a society in which Arab, North African, Berber and Greek Christian identities intersected in multiple ways. Historians who tend to view the Norman conquest of Sicily as part of a wider phenomenon of the aggressive defense of Christendom, or indeed as a precursor of the phenomenon of the Crusades, might well see the case of Elias Cartamensis as food for such an argument. But it seems to me closer, in fact, to the dynamic of witness and conversion that I've been discussing in the Italo-Greek texts, or indeed in the Cluniac lives of Abbot Maiolus, than it does to Holy War. As I remarked at the beginning of this paper, when we look at Holy War narratives, especially the First Crusade Chronicles, we see very little interest in the conversion of Muslims. Uh, there are exceptions. Uh, one exception is the earliest Crusade Chronicle, the anonymous Gesta Francorum, which includes a famous episode in which the walls of Antioch, uh, being besieged by the Crusaders, uh, are betrayed to the Crusader bowmen by the Turkish Emir Piruz or Firuz. In the Gesta version of the story, Firuz is prepared to do this because he has secretly converted to Christianity. It's surely significant that the author of the Gesta was a South Italian follower uh, of, uh, of Bohemond, uh, and, and therefore someone to whom notion of alliances and agreements between Christian and Muslim was a defining feature of their interaction. The conversion story is also followed and extended in the slightly later account of the First Crusade by Robert the Monk, written in about 1108. In this northern French version, Firas asks Bohemond how it can be that, as he's heard the Christians say, the Crusaders will be helped by an army of saints. How specifically can saints in heaven carry the material equipment of a warrior? Bowman consults his chaplain and obtains the answer that saints carry weapons as signs of divine sanction for the coming battle. Firas is, sufficient, Firas is sufficiently satisfied by this to convert, and he subsequently, like Elias Cartamensis, becomes a model of faithfulness. There are other examples of early crusaders bearing witness against uh, Islamic belief, uh, and one of them I've um, put uh, 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 in the, the a picture on the uh, left, um, uh, the painting um, of um, the uh, uh, Bishop uh, Timo of, of Salzburg, who, it, when captured by Turks on the crusade of 1101, smashed a golden statue that he saw them worshipping and that he ha uh, claimed held a demon. Uh, and was uh, martyred. But these episodes are, as I've indicated, the exceptions in early crusade narratives. If we look forward to the context in which the life of Vitalis was translated in the Episcopate of Robert of Trica Rico uh, in 1194, witness and conversion seems even more exceptional. Robert became bishop in the year that Saladin conquered Jerusalem and the Third Crusade was launched, 1187. None of the crusading rhetoric of that period, chronicles, treatises such as Peter of Blois De Peregrinatione Jerusalem, talk seriously about conversion as part of the framework of Christian responses to, to Islam. But by way of conclusion, I want to suggest that if we fail to see an interest in witness and conversion in texts written about the time of the First and Third Crusades, it may in fact be because we're not looking in the right places. If we return to the Italo-Greek hagiographies or to Cyrus's life of Maiolus, what's striking in the Christian-Muslim dynamic is the expression of the fundamentals of doctrine. Muslim skepticism about Christianity, as expressed in the life of Elias the Troglodyte and the life of Maiolus, and Christian profession of faith in the life of Elias of Enna and the life of Vitalis, and in Maiolus's resistance to his captors. These polemical debate passages form a distinct aspect of some hagiographies uh, of the period, examples of which can be found in both Greek and Latin texts. 
I'd suggest that there's also an example that we can find in a hagiographical text that circulated far more widely than either the Cluniac dossier on Myolus or the Italo-Greek saints' lives that I've been discussing, and that can be found in both Greek and Latin versions in the 11th century and subsequently in the vernacular as well but it's a text which we might not immediately associate with Christian Muslim polemic, namely the life of St. Catherine of Alexandria. The earliest known versions are Greek, but Latin versions originating from the mid 11th century to, uh, from Monte Cassino became phenomenally popular in Normandy and England in the 12th century and later in German speaking territories. There are numerous spin-off versions, so prayers, hymns, and a now lost liturgical drama from the early 12th century. Of course, the life of St. Catherine has ostensibly nothing to do with Christian Muslim encounters, but the centerpiece of the text is the debate that Catherine holds with pagan philosophers sent by the emperor to argue her out of her adherence to Christian teaching. Catherine ends up through flouting the philosopher's arguments in converting them to Christianity. The theology in her argument is strikingly similar to that in Elias of Enna's homily to the Muslims, namely that the gods worshipped by the pagans are not real, but human constructs. In essentials, the same dynamic is at work here as in the Italo-Greek hagiographies. The saint suffers violence or a threat of violence at the hands of a non-Christian power and responds by verbal demonstration of the tenets of Christian doctrine, and an attempt to convert the wielders of violence. So let me very briefly then try to draw some of these various strands together. In thinking about Christian Muslim interactions in the period before and during the Crusades, we have, I suggest at our disposal, a wider set of writings than has usually been deployed. Like the lives of Elias the Troglodyte and the life of Vitalis of Castronuovo, the life of St. Catherine and other texts significant for the cult of her spread, uh, the spread of her cult, were circulating in monastic circles in the West at the same time as texts that presented Christian, non-Christian contacts in purely bellicose ways. Furthermore, these writings are distinctively monastic. They were produced in monasteries and largely for monastic communities and their clients. While portraying Muslims as hostile to Christians, as sacrilegious, even barbaric, they emphasize polemical dialogue and conversion as legitimate forms of resistance rather than violence. The protagonists of these texts are unarmed and prepared for martyrdom. If we consider what's happening in such texts from the point of view of the communities that produce and use them, we can see that confrontation with Muslims, with the demands such encounters make, on the saint's fortitude, faith, and resources of persuasion is an inherent part of the construction of monastic sanctity. Thank you very much. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. What a fascinating paper. Um, I've, I'm just amazed there's quite so much material available for such a distant period, and I think you've really brought it to life to us, uh, for us. So thank you very much indeed. Um, we are um, exactly on the hour and we um, take a little pause at this point so our speaker can um, catch his breath. Uh, we would love um, questions from the audience. We've got the chat function, but we uh, find it a lot easier to monitor if you actually put your questions in the Q&A um, that's down there as well. So we're going to take a five minute pause. Do start putting your questions in there. We'll be back in five minutes and I'll, I'll feed your questions to Andrew. Thanks to the audience and thanks to you, Andrew. Hello everybody and welcome back. Andrew, thank you very much again. Um, some questions have started to appear in the um, question and answer, so I'm gonna just uh, feed a question to you if that's all right. So Tim Sparry asks, what evidence uh, or manuscripts are there from the Muslim perspective, I just put my quotation marks, for the conversion of monks of Muslims to Christianity? The conversion of Muslims in, in, um, in, from, from Muslim sources. Uh, yeah. Um, that's no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not entirely certain it's about Muslim sources, it's about the conversion. I mean, he hasn't specified the sources, 
Um, but I mean, I guess the question about the Muslim perspective, if, if there's any element. Of oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, 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 I see. Um, no, um, one wouldn't expect there to be. I mean, um, one has to, in, in dealing with this genre of uh, hagiography, whether we're talking about um, the Greek or Latin hagiography, one has to read these sources critically and to some extent against the grain um, and see them as being texts that um, are, that, that sort of have elements um, of um, reality, but also strong elements of uh, wishful thinking um, or, or uh, a kind of um, a, a kind of narrative truth that, from the point of view of the authorship, that uh, goes beyond uh, what we might call objective reality. So I suppose what I'm saying is that we don't know, we don't have any corroborating evidence that these conversions ever happen, that these episodes happen. And conversely, we don't have any um, any evidence that um, monks um, are, are of conversion to Islam. Um, but um, presumably it's it's taking place. I mean, this is a, a world in which um, the um, people of different, uh, with religious, different religious backgrounds and identities are to some extent mixing with each other um, sometimes in contexts of violence, such as in, in the kind of raids um, and conquests uh, through um, marriage, um, enforced um, sexual unions. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, there are, to be sure, there are, um, it's, it's difficult sometimes to put your finger on what a particular religious identity might mean, what conversion might, might mean. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, I'm sure it is very difficult. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Iftikhar Malik. He says, a monolithic view of Muslims, given the Seljuk victory at Manticat and Muslim presence in Iberia and Sicily, is understandable, as is the pervasive view of the Jews during this period. But then how come we find Bas Adelard 1080 to 1152 spending years in the Levant, most probably in Antioch, translating for Ismi and Euclid, amongst others, from Arabic into Latin? Yeah, um, that's, that's a nice question. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I, um, I'm not suggesting that, um, that there is a, a monolithic view of Muslims or Islam in um, either the Latin West uh, or in the Byzantine world or in a world that kind of bridges the, um, the two. Um, and yes, you're absolutely right. There are many um, Western scholars, Adelard of Bath being a very good example, who spend um, long periods of their lives um, in, um, with, with uh, learning Arabic in order to be able to translate uh, Greek texts, scientific texts into um, Latin for the benefit of um, a Western audience. Uh, so there is indeed um, knowledge um, of uh, Muslims, um, if you like, at sort of ground level, at, at, at the level of, of, of reality and the level of, of kind of interaction. Um, we don't know really what so much what Adelard of Bath thought about um, the Muslims he came into contact with in, in Spain. Um, but um, I think that it's possible for people to hold um, both uh, in, in their heads at the same time, um, both um, the knowledge that act people of, of a different religion whom they come into contact with and know um, are um, not uh, sort of the demonic people they might, be, they might be portrayed as in theological texts, but also to subscribe to um, the theological truth in, in such texts. So, um, I suppose there is, that we, we need to expect inconsistency in Western attitudes towards Muslims and Islam in this period. Thank you. Uh, Joshua Rice asks us, did the rising popularity of the life of St. Catherine of Alexandria in the 11th century, with its central episode of St. Catherine debating with the, quote, pagan philosophers, lead to or influence any real world disputations in the public arena between Christians and Muslims? <laughs> 
Uh, thank you, Josh, <laughs> for that um, difficult question. Uh, uh, no, not as far as I know. I don't, well, at least there's, there's no evidence that I can think of that it influenced any real world debates. Um, but I think that it, it might be seen as a kind of formulaic type of such debates. And we do know that such real world debates did take place um, at a rather later period. Uh, they're taking place in uh, Sicily, um, in uh, Norman, uh, later in Norman Sicily, they're taking place in Spain. Um, so yes, they are. And um, it would be nice to think that texts like the life of, of Catherine of Alexandria might um, have, have been some influence. I think that the, 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 the arguments um, in them certainly inform um, the way that arguments um, uh, against um, Islam in such actual stage debates uh, come to be constructed. And that's what I was mentioning at the end. Um, the theology, um, the theological argument used in the life of Catherine of Alexandria, which is very similar to that found in the life of Elias of Enna, is actually um, a, an argument that, go, that can be traced back. Uh, you find it in John of Damascus as well. Uh, you find it in the um, um, anonymous uh, Joseph and Balaam text. Um, so it, there is a kind of thread that takes it all the way back. You find it in Lactantius in the fourth century arguing against uh, paganism. Um, so there is a kind of transposition of a theological um, debate that originally took place between Christians and or by Christians against pagans textually. There's a transposition of that to debates between Christians and, and Muslims, both textually and probably in, in reality at a later stage. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question and thanks, Andrew. Uh, I have another question from Christopher, I'm afraid I haven't got a surname. He, he says, do the Muslim texts dehumanise the same way, uh, do the Muslim texts dehumanise the same way the Christians do in their texts? Um, I'm going to defer on that question. <laughs> it's an excellent question, thank you for it, but um, I'm not um, expert enough in um, Islamic sources um, to be able to, um, to, to answer that. My, from, my, um, super, from a superficial knowledge of some um, Islamic texts um, dealing with, some Arabic texts dealing with crusades, there are certainly similar tropes that are used. Um, about Christians as one finds on the Christian side about Muslims. Um, they're not exact, they don't exactly kind of um, transfer one to the other, um, but one does find some um, relatively similar dehumanizing tropes, but I don't, I don't want to make a kind of blanket um, answer to that with any kind of authority. You understand, thank you. That's a question from Edward Cheney. He says, uh, the martyrdom of Chen who didn't make it to sainthood seems to have a lot in common with that of the early 4th century St Erasmus of Formia, himself completed with St Elmo, who also had his intestines found out of him, in this case on the order of Emperor Maximum, but likewise for refusing to worship a statue. I seem to remember, however, that the whole story may have been a retrospective explanation of the image of a windlass next to St Erasmus, anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, that's a case where um, a... Um, an early 12th century text is definitely drawing on early Christian martyrology um, and um, that it shows kind of textual knowledge of, of um, um, a, a kind of a genre is if you like being rediscovered because the context of the Crusades provides a new, new opportunities um, to talk about martyrdom um, and to rediscover martyrdom as a, a kind of Christian virtue or a virtue that can lead to sanctity in a way that hadn't been possible for centuries, really, since the, um, uh, since the kind of Christianization um, of most of, of, of Europe um, in, the, um, in the period between the third and the, the sixth centuries. Um, once you no longer have um, the possibility of martyrdom within the Christian world, um, you you know, the sanctity has to be constructed in a different way. But the Crusades provides an opportunity for a kind of rediscovery and redeployment of those uh, martyrdom tropes and ideas. Thank you. 
Um, Christopher Kurth asks, are there any lessons for today that can be learned from past monastic community relationships with Muslims? Uh, I'm sure there are. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure that there are. Um, some of the lessons are probably to avoid. Uh, 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 lessons of avoidance rather than of, of imitation. Um, but um, I, I'd rather stick to the past, I'm afraid. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Andrew Buck has said, do we get a sense that the monastic textual traditions regarding relations with Muslims then impact the behaviours of monks who settled in the Latin East? Um, yeah, uh, a very good question. Thank you, Andrew, for that. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I, I can't... I can't think of any examples of that. I mean, that's partly because um, there aren't um, there aren't very many hagiographical texts um, from um, monasteries in the Latin East. I mean, the the the, the, the Christ, once the, the Western settlement in um, the Eastern Mediterranean, what we know is usually as the Crusader States, for, as, a, as a kind of shorthand, the Church in the Crusader States doesn't produce much in the way of hagiography, um, doesn't produce much in, in the way of saints, and therefore um, there aren't many saints' lives. There are some um, fragments, um, and there's some indication, um, I'm thinking of um, this, the short um, collection of, um, monk, uh, of biographies of monks by Gerard of Nazareth, um, uh, written in the 12th century, where one of his monks is not a saint, but one of his monks is is depicted uh, preaching uh, to the Muslim captors of King Baldwin II. He goes to visit Baldwin II in prison and preaches, takes this as an opportunity not only to chastise Baldwin for his immorality, but also to um, uh, to to preach to uh, the Muslims as in a kind of precursory way that St Francis would do a generation or so later. So there are some little indications of that kind of thing going on, but very few. Thank you very much. Um, another question from Tim Sperry, who asks us, is there any evidence for um, quotation mark hybrid faiths emerging from such attempted conversions where Christianity and Muslim beliefs were merged? That is a lovely question. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think it's an impossible, well, it's not an impossible question to answer. It's an impossible question to answer in anything less than kind of book length, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's what I was slightly getting at that in answer to a previous, I think your previous question, Tim. Um, I think so. I think that there are lots of confused identities. And that's something which I try to bring out in the quote from Alex Metcalf about um, pre-Norman Sicily. Um, but these are regions where um, because there is, um, there are children born to um, uh, unions between um, Greeks and Latins, uh, you know, Greek speakers and, and Latin speakers, there are all between, uh, sometimes between um, Muslims and Christians. Um, but, and so across the Mediterranean, not just in Sicily, but this is a feature also of the Eastern Mediterranean, um, it's not always easy um, to uh, to tell what, you know, how someone has been brought, in which faith someone has been brought up, or what their own kind of claimed um, religious identity is. And the texts that we use uh, don't all, well, they, they don't make clear, because they have no interest in making clear, that there are any shades um, of, uh, uh, of kind of in-betweenness, or any, um, that that there are any kind of, that there is what you, you call in your question, a hybrid faith. I'm not sure that I would go with that um, uh, term hybrid faith, but I take what you, what you mean. Um, and I, th I think there is, yes, I think there is a lot in that, definitely. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Um, Stephen Spencer asked, thoroughly enjoyed your paper, Andrew. It reminded me of Marcus Bull's 2003 article arguing for the potential depictions of Muslims in Western miracle stories to shape the ideas held by and condition the response of the First Crusaders. Do you think that a similar case could be made for the hagiographies you've studied, given that they were translated into Latin? I realise the monastic audience of the text might be problematic to this. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to um, 
look at the question <laughs> just to make sure I get it um, right. Um, yeah, um, I, th I think what you're asking um, there, Stephen, um, is, <laughs> is there a kind of smoking gun <laughs> from um, these texts to um, practices or, or to, to uh, kind of reading practices um, that inform the views of people writing about the um, crusade or participating in the crusade. And I'm, I want to be quite careful there and say that I can't find a smoking gun, uh, um, but it's very suggestive to me um, that a text like The Life of Elias the Troglodyte is translated into Latin in the 1080s, um, sort of 10 years before the First Crusade, and in a milieu um, which is certainly a First Crusading milieu, in other words, um, the Abbey of, the Abbey of Santa Euphemia, with its connections back to the rule. This is very much a First Crusade milieu, um, and the liturgical use of that life, that translated life in the monastic community, um, I'm suggesting must have meant something. We can't actually point to it then having a deliberate, uh, having a distinct influence or effect um, yet. Um, but um, I, I think it very likely that it that it might well have done. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, a question is coming through the chat that I'd like to put to you, um, Andrew. Um, we've been asked: these lives are written in a very specific and heightened context, a contest and potential conflict, and they clearly serve a purpose in this way. But do the lives and these views of Christian monks as peaceful converters ever come to be interpreted and read differently by later generations? In short, do these lives have afterlives? Um, that's interesting. Um, I mean, I, um, in my paper, I was talking really about one particular dimension or aspect of these lives and suggesting that um, they, uh, and that, that um, dimension, that dimension of um, uh, polemical exchange and sometimes conversion and, and miracle in the context of, of Christian Islamic exchange, um, that that is, although it forms, oh, it is part of a broader backcloth to all of these texts, it only takes a very small part of the, of the texts themselves. It only takes a very small part of the texts themselves. So um, certainly these lives have afterlives in the sense that they are read and used as exemplars of saintly behavior, particularly monastic saintly behavior. So they're very influential in the construction of a particular kind of monastic um, identity and monastic conduct um, in southern Italy. Um, but um, it's, it's much harder to say whether the, that dimension, that aspect that I was talking about, how influential that that becomes, um, but um, I think broadly speaking, yes, they do have definitely have our, have um, afterlives. And um, Elias of Anna, um, Elias the Troglodyte, Vitalis of Castelnuovo, come to be really quite you know they're, they're prominent cults um, in in those distinct regions of uh, Calabria. Okay, thank you. Um, Andrew Buck asks us: Do we get a sense that the monastic textual traditions regarding relations with Muslims? then impact the behaviours of monks who settled in the Latin East? Uh, um, well, if only we knew more about the behaviours of monks <laughs> settling in the Latin East. I mean, I've, I've, I have um, uh, sort of partly um, referred, I referred to um, a text of uh, Gerard of Nazareth uh, as, as a kind of example um, of, of that. Um, I mean, one of the problems with trying to study um, monasticism in the Crusader states is that um, really except for um, the, uh, the, the, the kind of um, rupture that happens in 1187 with the conquest of much of the territory of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the other Crusader states, um, you almost wouldn't know that there, there were Muslims there. Muslims are mentioned sometimes in charter material as 
or in other words, or people with Muslim name with with Arabic names are mentioned in um, uh, lists of um, individuals um, who are uh, tenants or villains of the of some of the monasteries. But you almost wouldn't know that that's the context from most of the documentation that we have uh, about. Um, um, Latin monasteries. Most of the documentation is actually kind of, as it were, Latin facing rather than um, Muslim facing. So I think um, it's it's difficult to um, to be able to kind of to bring any evidence to to bear on that question. Thanks. I'm just going to um, scoop up the remaining um, questions and comments that we've got in the questions and answers at the moment. So Sheila White's asked, "Why was the monk called a troglodyte?" And I'll just uh, put the other ones to you as well at this time. <laughs> Um, Ifta Malik also adds, in reference to the question about Muslim views, Sultan Kamal's parleys with St. Francis in 1219 and the visit of famous Sufi Baba Farid soon after the Third Crusade from Punjab to Jerusalem to do his 40-day meditation reveals wider contemporary Muslim knowledge of and multiple forms of engagement with the Crusades and an element of being able to have a debate based on respect. Um, and just Edward Cheney also adds, in terms of conversion, the question given asks in his Grand Tour Diaries was why, unless pagans, quote, were being converted throughout this period in larger numbers than we acknowledge, so many Italian baptisteries were built with large central fonts for adult baptisms. This is less evident today, as so many of the fonts have been removed. So a few final points to put to you there, Andrew. You um, pick up on whatever you'd like to. Uh, OK, well, the um, uh, Elias is a troglodyte because he lives in a cave. Um, or at least he founds a cave monastery, um, which is um, not um, particularly usual, but it's certainly uh, a feature. It's one of, it, it, it's, it's, he's not the only person to do that. So um, a, troglodyte, uh, a troglodyte is obviously someone who lives in a cave. So he, that, that's why. Um, uh, thank you, um, Iftikhar Malik, for, for, for that. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you're, you're, I'm sure you're right about um, the um, the exchange between Francis and uh, um, Al Kamil in in um, twelve in twelve nineteen. Um, I think there there is you're probably right. I, I I don't know, but I'm sure you're right that um, that there are there are wider pockets of Muslim knowledge about Christianity um, by the um, late 12th, early 13th centuries um, than um, is the case in the period that I've been talking about, which is largely pre-First Crusade um, in terms of uh, Christian knowledge of Islam. There is a change, I think, that takes place within Christian world in the 13th century. Uh, and the 13th century does see um, a, a more kind of uh, systematic approach to the understanding of Islam. Part of that is brought about actually by something that I talked about a little bit in the beginning of my talk, which is um, the work of Peter the Venerable at Cluny, um, who commissions the first Latin translation of the Quran. That happens in the 1140s. And before that, there is no, there is no Latin, um, there's no translation um, of, of the Quran and, and therefore no knowledge uh, accessible to um, people whose language, whose reading language is Latin um, of, um, the uh, essentials uh, of the Islamic faith, um, but that does start to change um, in in the third, certainly in, in the thirteenth century. Um, the question about um, Gibbon and um, baptistry is an interesting one, but I'm afraid it goes outside my um, my purview, outside my my knowledge. Um, I don't. I can't answer that. I'm afraid. <laughs> Andrew, you've done an absolutely brilliant job of answering the questions that have been put to you. And um, I think we are all extremely grateful to you for your paper, for, a, for your uh, fantastic answers to the question and really for um, just bringing this subject to life for us. Um, I'd really like to thank you for such a fascinating, imaginative lecture. And thanks to all the audience as well who are here and um, amazing turnouts. It's been wonderful to see so many people listening. I'd just like to close our evening tonight by reminding everybody of a couple of our next events. We've got a book launch, um, Simon Newman's new book, Freedom Seekers. Um, and we're having an event to celebrate that on the 18th of February with Corrine Fowler and Gretchen Holbrook Bettina. Um, and that's also going to be the occasion of our special general meeting at which we'll be presenting our annual report and our accounts. And in May, Toby Green will be talking about English traders in West Africa 
in the 17th century in the next in our series of lectures. Um, we have very much else besides going on, so I do encourage everybody to look at the website and find out more about what we're up to and what's going on. But for now, I'd just like to say thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope to see you all again soon. Good evening. Thank you to the audience. Mm-hmm.